Hi there, hello, welcome to this webinar, IATEL webinar, um, organized by IATEL, this is the European Association of Technology and Health Learning. This webinar is organized by Etienne Hopley, uh, which is uh, the media chair of the association, and myself, Leila Hernandez Leo, as vice president of the association. IATEL missions is to enable and facilitate research and education in technology enhanced learning in Europe and beyond. And as part of its mission, the association is organizing a series of webinars that seek to spur of community discussion that can help to maintain high standards of research quality and professionalism in, uh, in our domain. In this line, IATEL have started a webinar series that we call The Profession, uh, which offers space to discuss overarching aspects related to the research profession in our domain. These overarching aspects will consider important challenges for our field that are derived from its sound nature, and that is an interdisciplinary research field, and from key issues related to responsible research. Uh, these key issues uh, in responsible research goes from gender diversity to public engagement, sustainability, ethics, and open science. And open science is the topic chosen for this first edition of the uh, first webinar, uh, in fact, uh, of this series um, is entitled Open Science, and it applies to technology enhanced learning. Um, open science is a critical issue considered by our community and the research community at large. The invited speakers, uh, Justin Reich and Malte Elson, that uh, we very much agreed and have agreed to um, to participate in this uh, webinar as invited speakers, will introduce this ongoing movement of open science, um, its benefits, why it's so important for our particular domain, challenges and the initiatives, uh, and existing initiatives of open science in Intel. Now, uh, Stian will introduce the speakers. Yeah, so um, welcome to the speakers and welcome to all the, um, uh, those who view us right now or who hopefully will watch the recordings. Um, to those who are live right now, um, you are welcome to um, join the chat to introduce yourselves. And we hope that during the presentations you can uh, raise some questions. We'll take note of those and we will uh, try to uh, introduce them into the discussion afterwards. We'll have quite a bit of time today for discussion. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about this because uh, as we know, it's uh, everything is changing uh, in, in terms of the new things that we can do with technology, but there's also very old issues around statistical reliability and uh, ethics that we are still trying to figure out today. Um, hopefully today's discussion can not only uh, lead us to reflect on how we as individuals or as researchers or as labs do our work, but also You all there? I lost. Uh, we, we lost Stian. Okay. Yeah. For really <laughs> That's enough of him. Yeah, no worries. So Hello? he's, he's yeah, back. back. We'll see, but you can continue. Yeah. So I was just saying that uh, in addition to how we as individuals and as, as researchers, you know, how can societies such as IATEL, how can journals, how can um, different um, uh, institutions support this? Because the scholarly community is made out of us. And so we can um, change the way that we do research to make it better. And uh, anyway. Uh, I'm looking forward to the debate today. The first speaker is Justin Reich, um, prolific uh, researcher and um, organizer um, from MIT. I know him from the Learning at S uh, Scale conference, which was, was a really wonderful experience. Um, he's also been um, public in pushing for uh, registered reports for new ways of doing open science. And I'm really looking forward to his presentation for today. I'll turn on your slides and off we go. Sure. Yeah. So, so the, the structure is like this. So each of the speaker will be uh, presenting for 15 minutes the, their views, and then we'll have discussion with questions and answers. Yeah. Great. 
Um, so I'll share some uh, stuff that we've been doing recently. This is joint work with uh, Tim Vanderzee. Uh, there's a preprint of an article that we have uh, called Open Education Science. So if you study open, if you if you do a search for Open Education Science and and Vanderzee or Reich, you'll come up with it. Actually, if somebody uh, can plop it in the chat, They'll, actually Tim's here, so Tim can probably plop it in the in the chat. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our views on open education science and how we're um, trying to make one step towards a better professional practice by uh, helping ARA online, uh, ARA Open, one of the new scholarly journals from the American Education Research Association, uh, take advantage of a new format for publishing called scholarly reports. Um, so for Tim and I, open education science is a set of practices which are designed to increase the transparency of research at every stage of the research process. So all of us do very different kinds of research. We interview people, we look at data, we run experiments, we build stuff and we put it into the world. Um, but most of our studies tend to have four phases of designing the study, of collecting data, of analyzing that data, and then publishing our findings. Um, for us, open education science is the process of looking at each of those four phases and trying to figure out how we can increase the transparency of our reasoning and our methods um, in each of those stages and how we can make things more accessible. Um, another way to transparency and access are sort of two of the main themes that are behind our work. Uh, another big theme I would say is that many of the norms that we use in science were developed in an age of analog and print. Um, so part of the reason why we summarize our work for one another is that we used to communicate with one another by printing things in journals and books and shipping them all over the world. Um, and you know, shipping paper is heavy and expensive and so we've made things short. Um, but we've now entered a world in which we basically have unlimited and free uh, space with which to share ideas with one another. Um, that's not a case for getting rid of summaries. Actually, most of us are way too busy to read everything that people are doing. Um, but it does mean for the six other people in the world who really want to know in detail what we're doing, it's increasingly easy, at least possible, um, for us to be able to do that thing causes another um, because uh, much of the inspiration for some of these changes in open science kind of emerges from that. But I think a lot of the things we're saying also apply potentially to qualitative research and design-based research and other kinds of things. Um, so for a long time, um, people have argued that if you want to do a really good experiment, if you want to do really good confirmatory research, there's a few important things to think about. Um, this is from one of my favorite articles uh, by John Tukey, who was published in 1980, called We Need Both Exploratory and Confirmatory Research. Um, and he goes on to explain why we need exploratory research, why people should take data sets and they should do whatever they want with them. They should run a gazillion tests, they should correlate everything with everything else, they should do anything they want. And from that exploratory research, we should generate some questions. A few of those questions will be so important that we really should find out the answer to those questions. And if we really want to know the answers um, in really rigorous ways that are defensible to practitioners, that are defensible to policymakers, we have to do two things. Um, you have to randomize. In fact, then he capitalizes it and puts a big exclamation point, says randomize. Um, and we've probably actually stretched that a little bit now. We know there's some things other than randomization, like regression discontinuity designs and difference and difference designs and other kinds of things that let us draw causal inferences. But we have to have some kind of method that lets us draw causal inferences. And then he says we have to pre-plan the main analysis and potentially having two main analyses may be too many. And I think, you know, we've known this for a long time um, that if we want um, that the hypothesis driven research should actually start with a hypothesis and a plan to answer that hypothesis. Um, one of the things that I think most people recognize at some point in their doctoral training um, is that the methods sections that we read in journals um, are not actually a description of what happened. Um, they're meant to be summaries, um, but all too often they sort of drift into fiction. Um, one of the most common fictions out there is that people claim to have a hypothesis before conducting a study that they didn't actually have. Um, oftentimes when people, um, so in some studies, the first time someone writes their hypothesis is when they're writing the sort of you know draft of the journal article at the end of the study. Um, but we know increasingly um, that, that 
that pre-planning is really important and, and being very clear with people um, about what steps we took when is really important to making effective inference about the quality of a research study. Um, I, I can sit, speak less about this in the rest of the world, but I can tell you that in the United States, um, we basically only listened to the first of these two points that Tukey offered. So we did a randomize and we have to pre-plan. Um, and so you can go to documents um, like uh, identifying and implementing educational practices supported by rigorous evidence, a user-friendly guide. Um, narrator, it was not user-friendly, um, but it was close to user-friendly. Um, this is you know, a 15-page document um, that was meant to guide policymakers and practitioners in interpreting um, educational research studies. And it has pages and pages describing how important it is um, that the that the study is randomized and that the randomization works. And there is no mention in this 20 page document of any kind of pre-planning. Um, it basically sort of anchors on to Tukey's first suggestion in a very deep way while paying attention not at all to the second, um, both of which are really essential. So that leads us to kind of where we are now, um, which you know has four really serious problems in our scholarly literature. Um, so that one is it's increasingly clear um, that when researchers have total freedom um, to make analytic decisions after they've seen the data, even well-meaning people can iterate through methodological choices that get them to the point of finding something of statistical significance. This is particularly possible in technology-enabled research. Um, so in many kinds of technology-enabled research, particularly research that has this increasingly rich clickstream data where we sort of know everything that everyone's done, a lot of what we're doing in the research process um, is creating summary measures in various kinds of ways. We're figuring out things like, um, what, how, what was the time on task that we can abstract from clickstream records? Um, what are the summary statistics of how many days that people logged in or things like that? Um, each of those operationalizations is a set of decisions to be made that have alternative choices. Um, all of these vast number of variables that we've now constructed, these out, the outcome variables that we've constructed, we now have a wide variety of alternative specifications and alternative sort of correlations we can make and so forth. And essentially, you know, even with a well-designed randomized control trial, there's still enough degrees of freedom that you can sort of mess around with things. You can add exclusion cases, you can add screen criteria, you can do all these things until you find something that's statistically significant. Um, and uh, um, as a result, we're biasing our literature with too many findings that claim statistical significance when we're probably really just mining noise rather than sharing signal with people. Um, on top of that, we have some real structural incentive problems in our field, um, which is that journals are biased towards publishing positive results or sort of if they do publish negative results, they're kind of like interesting or or, or overturning results. Um, and as a result, when lots of people run studies, if their findings are null or their findings are gonna be difficult to publish, they just don't publish them. Um, we had, you know, one of the things about statistical inference, one of the things about um, using frequentist statistics, using p-values, um, is that what p-values help us do is they do a kind of long-term error control. They say, you know, over the whole body of studies, um, there shouldn't be more than 5% uh, false positive findings. But the only way to sort of track that, if you know all of the studies that are happening, if people are routinely taking studies and not publishing them, um, then we're biasing our publication records towards, um, you know, the scholarly literature towards um, a set of findings which are not representative of the full set of research that people have done. So then one of the symptoms of all of these problems is the repeated failure of uh, studies to replicate um, that we find, you know, since, our, since, our, since we have these methods which make it too easy for us to make positive findings, um, and since we disproportionately publish positive findings, when, you know, it's too rare as it is, but when people go back into the scholarly literature and try to replicate things, um, you know, there have been high profile cases of them not replicating. Um, you know, and then, you know, one kind of related part of all of this, which is sort of crazy, um, is that many people have difficulty accessing any of this stuff because we've developed this sort of insane system where um, people in universities uh, produce research and then they for free peer review each other's research and then they give it to journals um, that sell that research back to us um, at exorbitant costs, which universities like Harvard and MIT find increasingly impossible to pay. Um, so there's this whole suite of problems um, within our field 
that that we think should be uh, you know a serious concern for researchers at every level from the most junior to the most senior and we should be you know in every generation we should be thinking about how do we take advantage of what we've learned from the past about research how do we take advantage of new technologies new network technologies to improve um, our profession ultimately to provide more transparency that allows for more systematic scrutiny um, that allows for policymakers and practitioners to have more confidence in the work we're doing um, so open education science is really about tackling these four problems and, and probably more, but, but these are four of the most significant problems and tackling them by trying to make our work more transparent, often taking advantage of new network technologies. Um, maybe I'll pass on this one. Um, I'll pass on a couple of these. Uh, so let me tell you about one project that we've done to try to uh, address this. Um, which is with ARA Open, the new open access journal from the American Education Research Association, we have been publishing a special topic on registered reports. Um, and the idea behind registered reports is that we're gonna evaluate research publications in two phases. Um, we're gonna ask people before they have uh, conducted their study or before they have analyzed their data to write up the first part of their study to say, this is the introduction to our study, this is the background and context, this is the literature, um, and these are the methods that we plan to use. And to provide that to a group of peer reviewers, and ideally actually to publish that uh, online through a process called pre-registration, um, where we publicly release the, the plans that we have for our study in advance, um, so that people know, can make it, so the readers especially can make a distinction between what kinds of decisions were made before looking at the data and what kinds of decisions were made after looking at the data so that um, we make a distinction between prediction uh, and post-diction. So the process ends up looking like this. Um, people develop idea, they design a study, and then they write this kind of stage one document, and then they send that document per peer, per peer review. That's the phase that we're actually in right now um, with our special topic. Um, so people are sending us what is effectively sort of half of a research article. Um, they're sending us the introduction, the background and context, um, and the methods. And then people are providing peer review on that. I have to tell you, it's been really fun to be an editor for these interactions because you've got a bunch of researchers who are getting really good feedback on studies they're designing with enough time to make changes. Um, you know, oftentimes you get, you know, if you wait until the full study is conducted, um, then you can make some suggestions for, you know, what might be an interesting next study or what analytic techniques you might do differently, but you can't encourage people to rethink, you know, really fundamental parts of their design. Um, and we can offer people those suggestions um, at this point. You know, I, I mean, we, Another thing that we're finding doing this um, is that there's a certain kind of open-mindedness and friendliness that emerges from researchers um, reviewing each other's work when they don't know what the answers are. Um, so if people aren't familiar, you know, when 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 people have a stake in some kind of outcome, we say, well, this, you know, um, I don't think that this thing should be true, and so I'm going to attack the methods, or I think this thing should be true, so I'm not going to be as critical or, or closely looking. If you don't know what the results are, um, you really just focus on how important are the questions, how interesting are the questions, and how effective is the design. So then people go on to either um, conduct their studies, or in some cases, to analyze their data, and a bunch of the work that we do in technology-enabled learning, um, data is sort of constantly being collected. When people propose studies in MOOCs, it's, they, they don't wait for the experiment, but they wait to sort of look at the data they're looking at. Um, and then we're gonna get next is people are gonna write up reports. For those stage one studies, that we have conditionally accepted, we offer them an in-principle acceptance, which means if the once our peer reviewers agree that a study is well-designed, we agree to publish it if they do what they say they were gonna do, um, regard, without prejudice to what the findings are. So we're, if, if every study we publish is a null finding, we'll publish a whole book full of null findings and that will be entirely fine with us um, because we don't wanna be prejudiced on publishing things whether or not the findings are interesting, we want to publish things, whether or not the questions are important and the studies are well designed. Um, the, uh, um, and so we're excited to be sort of shifting into these phases. So we think that, that so this can begin to address some of the challenges we have before. There's going to be more transparency um, between readers, between editors, between publishers about when people design what in their study. We think we're going to be able to publish a wider range of work because we're not going to be prejudiced as to what the outcomes are. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to publish better work because people are getting really high quality feedback um, early enough in the process to be able to make changes with what they're doing.
As I've been talking to folks about this, I was trying to figure out if I could uh, fix things on my end. Okay. Um, here are a few ideas that we have for advancing this, and then I'll turn it over to Malta. Um, was just like, how do you go about convincing more journals to accept these kinds of submissions or to address other kinds of um, strategies for improving open science? You just ask, that's it. Um, everyone listening to this webinar is part of some sub community in our field. And there is no one who has expertise, deep expertise around these issues. We're all kind of figuring it out. Um, but I think there are a whole bunch of us who think that we'll end up in a better place if we conduct these kinds of experiments than if we sort of leave things as they are and wait to see if things change. There's no one is more qualified than you, whoever you are sitting listening to this, um, to go to the journal in your subfield and say, hey, I think there's some important ideas that are out there about pre-registration, about registered reports, about other strategies for improving open science. Um, and I would love to help you try to work this out. Can I volunteer to be an editor? Can I volunteer to give a talk about some of the things I'm hearing about at our next conference? Um, can we volunteer to sponsor a workshop? Uh, can we uh, make connections between you and some of the organizations like the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science or the Open Science Foundation, the Center for Open Science um, that are doing this kind of work? Um, I think the you know uh, as people are thinking about next steps and and how to contribute, um, there's there you know as, as Stan said in the beginning you know the the field is us. It's just us as individuals making choices to improve things, um, and and there are no barriers for any of us to be able to say what can I do to volunteer to try to bring some of these ideas forward. So that's some starting thoughts for me, and then I'll I'll let Malta take it from here. Okay. Um... Thank you. Um, I'll only add a few thoughts and I'll try to be um, redundant with, uh, with what Justin uh, already said. And I think he said most of the things that are important already. Um, I, uh, I organize, I try to organize my, uh, my thoughts um, around the questions that were um, suggested um, to us. Um, and I think with regards to the definition of open science, um, I fully agree it is it is about uh, transparency, um, but it's more than just accessibility of data and, and preprints and all of that stuff. Um, the transparency um, allows others to fully understand the research process that is reported in journals. Um, it allows others, it, it increases um, accountability in the way that others are able to actually evaluate um, the research, uh, which right now I think is very difficult sometimes when you read a paper to actually figure it out and to, um, to make a, you know, qualitative judgment, is this a good study from the information authors disclose um, in, in papers? It also increases replicability in the sense that it allows others to verify um, the, the conclusions or the quality of the research independently from the original authors. So if all of the information are um, publicized somewhere, um, this allows me to, to verify um, all of this um, in my own lab and I don't have to, I, I, it might be advisable to consult the original authors, but I don't, I don't have to in an ideal world. Um, and finally, it also allows extending um, research because sometimes authors don't think of everything um, that can be done with the data they collect. Um, sometimes new research questions come up um, and someone already collected data that uh, can be used to answer those questions. And they, at the time they collected it, they did, just didn't thought of it. So. Malta, your sound might have cut out. Yeah. Yeah, I can't hear you. I can hear you, Malta. I'm still left. Can you 
Can you hear me now again? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it allows extending research sometimes, um, well, um, because new questions come up, uh, but also sometimes because new methods are developed. So, um, and new methods are then, better methods are then used to um, to reassess the quality of the data um, that were published five, 10 or 15 years ago. And this is all, you know, this is all that, that open science is to me, and this is why I think it's so important because I think that's very, um, resonates uh, very much with what Justin said. Um, papers need to be research reports and not research brochures. Um, and I think um, this can only be achieved when all of the information, um, you know, including hiccups during the research process, and everybody knows those things happen, and um, if those are transparently reported, even if that means that we probably need to talk about our findings um, being less conclusive than we want them to be, but that is, this is fine that to me. Why is, um, why is open science important to um, technology enhanced learning? Um, it's important to all research, of course. Um, and um, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that it's particularly important for, um, for this field. Um, that being said, I think um, uh, working in a research area that is sort of between um, fundamental or basic research and between applied research, um, I think we have maybe a special accountability towards the public that the um, that the things that enter practical work that enter the field are robust, that are that they are reliable, that they do what, what we say um, what we say they do. And I think the um, these open science techniques or procedures are one of multiple ways um, this can be improved. What are challenges um, um, of open science practices in technology enhanced learning research? I think there are quite a few um, actually, and I think that the field needs to have some sort of discussion about these um, these these issues. I mean, this is we are having a discussion right now, but I mean, like actual field-wide discussion about standards um, and how we uh, and protocols, how we address these. Uh, because my my sense is that many of these um, ideas are built around uh, classical psychological lab research, and they become increasingly important as you move away from the lab to other um, uh, to other domains of data collection. So let me I, I wrote down four, and I think more might come up um, during during Q and A. One problem that we are facing here are legal and ethical concerns with data sharing. Um, I'm all for making data available um, to everyone, um, but we we collect we sometimes collect data in schools, and then you know with minors they receive um, special protection that is even more stringent than others. But even when we collect data um, uh, on educational field processes at universities, we can't just share anonymized student records um, because even if we like even if they were anonymized, it's very easy for someone to figure out um, the grades if they have even some basic additional information like biological sex and age uh, and, and something else. Um, and I think this is this is um, this poses a challenge to the idea of making uh, research data available as much um, as that would be beneficial to everyone. Speaking of field research, a lot of these things. Happen, uh, are very useful, I think, when you have everything under control, but they are complicated in the field because fieldwork is messy and fieldwork is unpredictable. And I think you can have a, an extremely well thought out pre registration protocol. And um, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm very much in favor of registered reports. Um, but I think uh, sometimes, uh, or not sometimes, I think frequently, field researchers will um, encounter situations that they couldn't possibly think of. And again, this doesn't mean their research is, uh, um, is going to fail or that the paper will be rejected or um, that they somehow violated the, the contract that, is, that 
registered report basically forms. Um, but I think they, there has to be some kind of leeway um, with regards to the flexibility um, of the procedures laid out in the registration protocol and what, what actually happens um, during field research. Um, then policy. Um, a lot of the things um, in educational practice is based um, on previous research um, that recommended policy changes. Um, what do we do with those? Do we just discard them now? Um, do we, and if we do, this sort of, this requires us to admit that maybe a lot of educational policies aren't really all that evidence-based um, that we pretended they were um, previously. At the same time, um, society and policymakers, um, they put pressure on us to provide credible answers. Um, and I think as we increasingly use open science practices, we will see that credible answers are extremely tough to get. Um, but we can, like, we will be in a situation where we have to make excuses for a very long time because um, now with the new, the new standards, conclusive evidence is much harder to get than before. And finally, history, what do we do with all the research that has been done to this point with the traditional or conventional methods? Do we, do we ignore it? Do we, like, do we consider it exploratory or um, inspirational for future research? I think that is going to be a problem um, for a lot of fields that now increasingly use these practices um, and, you know, will try to synthesize research um, that has been created under very different um, conditions, under very different, you know, ideals um, as well. Yeah, I think those are my, my thoughts so far. Thank you very much. Uh, um, very interesting um, talks um, with fundamental questions uh, by the two of you. So I, uh, Malte was finishing with a, a set of fundamental questions that I was wondering whether just they may have uh, some answers or could complement uh, the, these fundamental questions or whether he shared uh, that, uh, that questions that Malte was um, pointing out. Justin? Yeah, I, I thought Malta had some really important points there. I wanted to respond to one of them, which is this question of um, how much freedom or flexibility do researchers have to make amendments in the field and so forth? Um, and I think the answer has to be um, researchers should absolutely do whatever they think is necessary at any point to um, study things in the most interesting, compelling, rigorous possible ways. Um, what I hope that we can do a better job of holding people accountable for um, is just explaining to people not only what choices they make, but when they make those choices. Um, I mean, this is again, one of the things that people have come to believe that the difference between exploratory research and confirmatory research is in, in quantitative work is whether or not you use methods that allow for randomization and causal inference. But another way to describe the difference between exploratory and confirmatory research is the temporal, the time relationship between your analytic decisions and your data. Um, confirmatory work requires making decisions before you have your data, um, and then the decisions that you make after you have your data are exploratory research. Um, so I think one practice that we'll see happening very commonly with confirmatory research is just results section that are broken up into two. Um, where we say, this is what we pre-registered, um, this is what the results are based on what we said we we're going to do. And then all this other stuff intervened. Um, and here are some things that we did in an exploratory way afterwards. Um, there also may be sort of like kind of changes that actually are, are you know, require you, you know, oh, we thought the data was going to come in this way, but it came in this different way. And so we coded it differently. Um, but that's sort of all the, the only change we make. The, the key is just being totally transparent with our readers 
Um, these are the number of post hoc decisions that we made. This is the scope of the post hoc decisions that we made. When we made these post hoc decisions, these are sort of sensitivity analyses around them and other things. And then policymakers and other researchers and practitioners can use their judgment to say, okay, well, I guess, you know, that seems like a pretty trivial thing. Um, I still have a lot of confidence in that result. Or boy, you know, that seems like some pretty major changes afterwards. Um, not that this is bad research, just I should probably treat it more as exploratory research um, rather than as uh, confirmatory research. Um, and so I think uh, that's going to be one change that we make in our publishing as well. You know, I mean, a huge part of this is just going to be being more precise with our readers about when we made the decisions that we made, because it is increasingly clear that that timing is really central. I should, also, I should say, too, that actually, you know, in many ways, qualitative researchers are well ahead of quantitative researchers in thinking about these issues. Um, qualitative researchers for a long time have, have called for people to be transparent about their positionality, to describe um, the positions and stances that they take towards issues before they write about them and study them. And I think conceivably some of these pra practices of, of pre-registration and transparency um, can uh, can be really valuable, you know, before people go out in the field to do interviews and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I was, I was Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, uh, I fully agree with what Justin said. And um, as I talk to colleagues about registered reports, I think this is one of the, the, the biggest misunderstandings that comes up is that they somehow feel the, the phase one protocol that they register sort of puts themselves in chains. Um, that it's like a corset of the research and then any deviation from that plan, even if it improves the, uh, the design, is will be punished by someone. And I think this is, um, but this is something they're actually worried about and one of the, um, the hurdles, I think, in making them more mainstream. Um, so I think we need to maybe improve the way we communicate what they do, which isn't putting a chain on anyone. It just makes decisions transparent. It just means we know what your plan was before all of these unpredictable things happened and you had to make the changes to your design, um, which, which you th then can describe as, oh, this was my plan all along, um, which isn't a chain at all. It just means you describe things as they have factually occurred um, over time. So I, I was just going to ask, um, so actually I had two questions. The first one you partially re, um, answered, but I was curious when you've been presenting these ideas to maybe sp especially conferences or journal publishers or societies, if there are any kind of um, common pushbacks or, or concerns that people have. Because when you, I mean, to me, it sounds brilliant. Like I, I love the idea. I mean, it's, it's something, yes, it's a lot of work. We have to do it slowly, but like, I'm very curious. Um, you know, if there's people who say, like, it's not just that it's a lot of work, but no, it's not a good idea, or we should not be requiring it, and so on. And you, and you get, but if you if you have other things that people are pushing back on, I think that'd be interesting. I'm also just curious on a personal plane if um, the two of you have actually done any pre registered studies yourself, or if you're currently planning any, and how that process is from because it, it, you know, being an editor is a different thing from being a, a re you know, an author and researcher. Justin, do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Um, so for common uh, retorts, I think here are a few. One is time. Um, is this going to take up more time? Uh, and I think the answer to that, especially over the long run, is no, it's going to shift the distribution of our time. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that we used to wait to write until after the data was collected and findings were being published that we're going to have to write earlier. Um, and so that's going to change our processes a little bit. It, you know, it's also for sure going to take, I mean, again, anybody who's showing up to this webinar is spending time doing this rather than um, doing their research. And so, you know, things like getting up to speed on some of these things will be an initial cost. Um, I, I, but I don't think there'll be much, I mean, maybe one area in which there probably will be more time, is, but I think it will be worth it, um, is that uh, I, I think journals will increasingly call for more and more sophisticated um, supplementary methodological materials. I mean, I think now most of the sort of most prestigious journals are asking for really short articles, um, 2,500 words, 5,000 words that are written, you know, for a general audience and then supplementary materials for the six other people who study what you study and want to be able to very closely and in detail go through what you did, you know, unless you have a breakthrough study that gets hundreds of people who, who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, 
But, you know, all of those materials, people should be generating anyway, um, you know, and, and we speculate that uh, in the future, you know, publications should be in Jupyter notebooks and in Mathematica notebooks and other things where you can actually see sort of, um, here's a little snippet of code, here's the table that's generated, here's some commentary about it and so forth. Um, we have a few things um, in my lab that we're working on um, that we're using these methods for. In the past, um, I've published some work. Uh, most of it revolves around uh, edX um, and some studies that we've been doing about how putting interventions inspired by social psychology and behavioral economics in pre-course surveys can have long-term impacts on people's uh, course taking patterns and outcomes and success and so forth. Um, so Mike Yeomans and I have a study that had a pre-registration um, where we uh, um, took a, a, a set of pilot courses and then we put a planning intervention at the beginning of a MOOC. It basically just said, write down your plans of how you're going to be successful this week um, or successful over the course of the course. And then we evaluated whether or not students who had access to this um, did better. We since scaled that up. Um, and so now basically every course being run in Harvard X, MIT X, or Stanford Open edX has some of these interventions. We have hundreds of courses and thousands of people. Um, and Renee Kiselcheck is, is helping us with some of the interventions that he piloted elsewhere. And we basically now have this sort of staggered set of interventions where, you know, back in January of last year, January of 2017, we implemented an intervention. We ran it from January to June. Um, it's taken us about a year of evaluation and data cleaning and things like that to be able to have some analyses we're confident in. Um, and we have this holdout data set now of um, things that we did from July to December of last year. Um, we also made some changes to the survey that we ran that have just started in January and the, you know, the longest courses are now finishing up. Um, and so essentially what's happening is that with each subsequent iteration, um, we have some confirmatory analyses. We have some exploratory analyses. Those sort of wave one exploratory analyses become our pre-registration for the wave two study. Um, you know, and we'll hopefully go through several cycles of this. Um, you know, for those of us who work in online learning environments, I think one major advantage that we have um, in doing pre-registration is that we really know exactly what our data is going to look like. I mean, for us, most of our code. Um, is being written before we uh, um, before we uh, oh, crack open our data. You know, the sort of first step when we open the data is basically just to press run. So there are GitHub repositories out there that have sort of all of our our code uh, that are that are um, pre-registered. Now we've decided to privately pre-register our work. My colleagues and I sort of have debates around this. Um, and as you might imagine, I'm a pretty big advocate of openness. But my my colleagues actually say, well, you know, I'm not sure that we're quite ready yet to sort of air our dirty laundry, our intermediary processes. And for me, that's great also. You know, the, the goal of these efforts is not to have every research group go from zero to 100 in their next study. The goal is to say, I'm thrilled that my colleagues and I are doing this pre-registration work or being guided by some of these practices and we're implementing some of them that we think are effective and make sense in our particular circumstance and not others. And I think that's really all that we can ask each other to do is pick kind of, you know, with every next study, with every next thing we do, what's one more way that we can be one step more transparent. If we all take those individual steps, we'll find that that norms change soon. So those are those are a couple of uh, thoughts. Yeah, I think um, there are um, there's a set of common responses, and I think Chris Chambers actually collects them in a in a publicly available document, which is hilarious. Um, I'll I'll mention a few that I've um, that I've encountered. I think the most common one is that it's not necessary. Um, that the, the quality of evidence in a field is already good enough. Um, and so all of these things are, yeah, um, they might be relevant for other, do other domains, but not my own. Um, and my response to that is, then what are you afraid of? If, if the quality of, of evidence is already that good, nothing in the results will change if you implemented any of these practices. Another concern that comes up is that it, these um, practices sort of imply a lack of trust. That it, it creates an atmosphere of, um, yeah, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of distrust on the researchers, um, to which I can only say that I shouldn't have to trust that someone did the things as they described them as they did. It's, it, it's inconsequential to me. They should just describe it and put it somewhere, uh, including the plans that they had when they uh, when they designed this thing. 
Then there's the argument that um, creative situation in particular stifles creativity and creativity is the key to successful research. I think the contrary is true. Um, I've edited a special issue um, very similar to Justin's and Tim's that only um, consisted of registered reports and seeing a, a brilliant plan for a study is uh, most to me much more satisfying than you know a completed half-assed paper that I don't know which parts actually happened and which didn't. Um, I think this is the kind of creativity that we need to encourage. That um, the design of a study is what what, what is relevant, and not um, that the story is um, is whole uh, or complete. Editors are worried that their journals um, could become the journal of non-results, um, and I think this is true. But if it's true, then what does it tell us about the journal in its current state? If it isn't the journal of results, it means many of those findings they publish are false positives. Another thing I have encountered is the worry that reviewers sort of become co-authors, that the back and forth for registered reports becomes so intense um, that reviewers, well, they, they become part of the study um, design process so much that they should deserve co-authorship, um, which I, uh, I guess there's, you could make that point, but you could make that point in the traditional system too. Uh, if somebody submits a theory paper and a reviewer asks the author to address a particular argument in more detail, is, isn't that also is, is that person also becoming a co-author of that theory paper? No, we, we know that this is not how it works. We know that there's, there are ethical guidelines for the author review relationship as well. Finally, um, uh, all of these practices would somehow punish exploratory research. And again, I don't think that is true at all um, because I don't, I'm not sure when's the last time you opened a journal in our field, but there isn't a lot of exploratory research. Almost all of the empirical research is presented as confirmatory. They always claim we had this hypothesis, we conducted the study, we ran this test, and we confirmed that our hypothesis was true. This is confirmatory research. There's nothing exploratory about it. So if this all of this, all of this punishes exploratory research, where is it published right now? I think the current practices punish exploratory research because nobody likes a, a paper that says, I didn't know what I should, ex I should have expected when I started the study. This is not something you typically read, but you can read it in a registered report. Um, in fact, I recently pre-registered an entirely exploratory study, which was the first time for me. Like we wrote down some of the ideas that we had and some of the variables we would assess. We described the sample and the population that we would sample from. And then we described the things we would like to explore. And it was in a way, I, I, I wasn't prepared to write this document. It was completely different from the things I've been trained for. Um, but it was also very satisfying because you were, I was in a position to, um, to honestly report um, the thought process that goes into, into this type of research. And then another thing that is also very similar to, um, to Justin's uh, wave one, two, and three uh, design, we are currently preparing a, um, a serial registered report um, of multiple studies where the results of study A inform the design of study B and those of study C and so on. And some journals, um, uh, some journals offer these um, these types of, uh, of reports, which I think are great um, uh, because, of course, sometimes you, you don't just want to run one study. Um, you, there might be more there that you, that you could explore. But, of course, it's also possible that after one study you think, well, there's no signal, I'm going to stop here. Um, and the journal is committed to publish um, the paper regardless um, of the number of studies or their results, which I think is, is fantastic. Yeah, a very interesting discussion, huh? as I find, uh, found especially uh, interesting some aspects that you um, stress in your presentations and you are also uh, mentioning now when you talk about uh, the relevance of exploratory research also in the frame of open science. Because many times when people talk about open science, they 
uh, refer to open access to publications or open data sets or open software. Um, I really like the concept uh, that uh, you mentioned about transparent reports. So it's not only about having open open uh, data, open um, access to journals, but uh, it's also about the process. And these transparent reports can uh, also cover not only uh, what is the traditional uh, control experimentation, as you mentioned, but also um, uh, studies that um, goes out of the lab from the lab to the to the field, and also consider this kind of exploratory research or other uh, the uh, not that much the quantitative uh, research, but also qualitative research. So I also wanted to know your opinions about um, the space for qualitative research in the open educational science uh, uh, movement, um, also. Uh, because uh, qualitative studies are very tied to, to their context uh, uh, that may have also uh, connections to cultural issues, um, other contextual dependencies. Um, many times we forget about those aspects when we think about open science uh, of only having open open data and open, uh, open data sets and open software. So your opinions about qualitative studies in the frame of uh, open educational science. So we, we read about this a little bit in our preprint and I've done some of this qualitative work in the past. Um, you know, again, I think there's a tradition in qualitative research about um, <clears throat> articulating positionality, about saying where you come from and what kind of beliefs that you bring to a research study. And I think that's, um, very much in line with this idea of we're going to tell people what we're thinking before we do data collection and what we think afterwards. So that seems like it, it closely connected. And certainly in other fields, there are people who are working on this. You know, as we were investigating this, we found people who are doing qualitative work in political science who are trying to figure out how to share data, how to increase transparency. Um, my Actually, my, my original uh, scholarly background was a, as a historian. Um, and one of the interesting things about historians is that, that so the primary work they do is in archival collections. Um, and if you go through the citations of history papers, you'll see a bunch of sort of box numbers and file numbers and things like that. And uh, and actually historians talk about their methods almost not at all. Most history journal articles don't have a methods section. Um, if you want to revisit what a historian investigates, you just go back to that box, you know, which is not trivial to go to the National Archives in whatever country and to go find that same box. But the, the evidence is nominally in most cases in a shared place. Um, that's not the case with, as you say, most of this contextually dependent qualitative research that we do. Um, and so I think there are some really good questions to be asked about how could we increase the level of transparency in that kind of work. Um, if people are interviewing kids who are in juvenile prison facilities, we should probably not be openly sharing their interviews with one another. There's too many dangers and too many risks there. Um, but there may be other contexts in which we're interviewing teachers or interviewing public figures or interviewing other people for whom we could, you know, create reasonable protections of privacy. So we could say, yeah, well, here's here's the data. Or we could make agreements with people, um, you know, as we're gaining their informed consent and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're going to take your interview. Um, we're going to de-identify it to the best of our ability and then we're going to make it part of a transcript um, so that other people can investigate this. Even if we don't do any of those things, I still think there are additional steps that we could do of, say, um, if there are coding schemes that people are using, having people come up with snippets of their data analysis to be able to share some examples of, the, of how they code particular documents um, or other sort of examples of their analytic strategies. I mean, a lot of qualitative papers have this kind of method section, which is, you know, we did a grounded analysis, came up with some codes, and we shared the codes with each other. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I think to a lot of people, it looks like, yeah, we kind of looked at it and thought about it, talked with one another about what we thought, and then we tried to code the rest of the thing together, and we sort of, you know, figured out the things we disagreed on the end. Any, any exercises to make that more transparent, particularly as people shift to um, qualitative data analysis software, you know, in Vivo and Atlas TI and Deduce, I mean, I, I think it would be really neat to see any of those companies um, try to develop more mechanisms that make it easy for people to export snippets, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, eventually I think Jupyter Notebooks and other things in the qualitative field are going to make it easier for us to be more transparent about each step in our analysis. It would be interesting to, to see what those looks like. But I would just encourage qualitative researchers who are exploring this, you know, there's, there's no way to 
I don't think we'll a priori sort of theorize what the best solutions look like. I think people should just go out and, and you know, be very conscious of data privacy and so forth and, and try stuff. Um, also, I've been convinced re recently of people who, uh, you know, again, um, um, data privacy is incredibly important. And sometimes when we protect people's data, we change it. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I've published some things in the past where we've said, hey, we took this MOOC data, we tried to make it openly accessible, but we changed it so much in the process. We did so much blurring and scrubbing. That's really not useful anymore. And I got some pushback from that. And folks said, it's not useful for doing original studies anymore, but it's useful in all kinds of ways. It helps people understand what the shape of data looks like. It helps people generate hypotheses. Um, it helps people, you know, it doesn't do everything. Um, but sort of any step of openness, you know, is often associated with some kind of new research opportunity that, that can be shared. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And also, um, sometimes there's, uh, there's interest in um, methodological research that has nothing to do with the, with the actual content of the data, but more with their with other properties and um, uh, you know, methodologists are often looking for data sets to try out uh, new analytical techniques, um, and you might not know that you're sitting on it, uh, basically, so it makes it makes sense to share it. Um, with regards to qualitative research, um, um, I think um, I, I, I agree that, um, uh, that with regards to the um, the reproducibility of the research, there might be different standards, and this is not something I'm worried about. Um, it's possible that um, that because of the context and because of the um, uh, you know peculiar properties of the entire situation, it's not possible to perfectly reproduce uh, a qualitative finding. Um, but other things can be reproduced, or other things can be made transparent. Um, and you no, know, this is not a all or nothing game, right? This is um, this is making your research as accessible um, as possible. And I don't mean accessible in the way that you post it on the internet and it's there for everyone. I mean accessible in the way that you help others understand what you did, um, and they help, you help others identify. Um, decisions that you make and to to help them evaluate um, whether those were good or bad decisions for their own research um, and if there's if there are parts that cannot be made explicit or that are you know for some reasons that are conceptually defined in a way that they cannot be reproducible i don't think that's a problem as long as you again transparently state that this is the case um, and that this is your, you know, your, your approach to, to your data. So I don't think, I don't see a big um, gap between quantitative and qualitative research when it comes to the practices we've been discussing today. Okay. Um, so I think this is probably a good point to wrap up. Um, I mean, there's so many interesting issues actually one thing i would have liked to talk more about is uh, data sharing um and you know something where you talked about people might analyze data from a different perspective in the future because they have new theories and you know now we have these ethics agreements and even things like gdpr which sometimes explicitly say you cannot use the data for um other purposes in the future and you know we're, we're struggling a lot with that i think that might be a future um episode because it's it's a big topic in itself um i want to thank you guys incredibly much both for being here today but even more for the stuff you're doing because i think um it's has an incredible i mean not just you guys but since you are here uh you can represent all the other people who are just uh, I'm, I'm really really excited about this i mean personally i've been very uh, cynical about a lot of education research um i mean to me anything that's not like a very, very narrow psychological test of, you know, perception patterns measured in milliseconds. I often don't even bother to read the results section. I read the theory. I look at, oh, they had a really cool idea. They came up with a really interesting design. And, you know, I, whether in the end students learned more or less, I, it's just, I don't believe it in a way. But I think that's a shame. Uh, I think we need innovative designs, new exploratory things. I need build better tools, do better, not just analyze data, but actually 
create better learning scenarios. But, you know, it would also be very nice to have solid research that is building blocks that are actually solid enough that we can start building on top of them. Um, and uh, I think this kind of work um, is, is really crucial in that direction. And I, and I really believe that we can have a huge impact as a community. Uh, hopefully, Yatao as a society um, can contribute um, to this. And I think this webinar is a really great beginning. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Maybe everyone uh, can have a few minutes if there's uh, any last words. Um, Davinia, do you want to say something? No, oh, nothing else. I agree. What do you say? <laughs> uh, again, the speakers. Um, yes. um, um, and the speaker had the floor now uh, um, to close the webinar with final uh, thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks everybody for, um, for joining. We have a preprint up for some of our open science ideas. We'd welcome whatever feedback you have on Twitter, by email, or things like that. I'm looking forward to just continuing to engage in these conversations. So, so thanks to the, the hosts for having us. Yeah, um, also thank you from, from my side. I think um, uh, resonating with, uh, with what um, Stian said, I think it's very, there's a, there's a, bit, of, a bit of a trap to become a cynical nihilist. Um, and I also went through that phase for, I think, three to four years. Um, uh, but I think, you know, events like this are an important part of, you know, sort of, um, uh, seeing that others struggle with the same problems and that they are um, constructively trying to, you know, to overcome, uh, to overcome this the state. Uh, so um, thank you for for organizing organizing this and the future um, future webinars. Okay. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone who came to listen. Thank you. <laughs>